Shadow versus the Demon Lord Ragnarok. Sid's final boss fight, Eminence in Shadow, cut content finale. Goddamn. This is the last any news Eminence in Shadow video that I'll be able to farm, which is really sad because <laughs> it's been free content. But hey, let's see what he has to say about the finale. Eminence in Shadow just got a whole lot bigger. Yeah. Not only is Sid the most powerful in his own world, but he also just slapped around the demonic archfiend ruling another one. The it fourth was an realm. Fight the anime unfortunately didn't show much of, but in exchange we were given a space nuke and an awesome cliffhanger. So he actually did nuke space, right? Now I titled it Galactic Atomic. I know this is not a galaxy. This is more like a planetary level, right? But if you say Galactic, it sounds cooler on YouTube and people might click on it. But anyways. He wiped out, except for our planet and maybe the sun, the entire solar system is just gone. Bro just did that for fun? Like, you didn't have to. This is so unnecessary. And then not only that, he had... His attack was so fucking strong, it created that dimensional gap into the different realms, right? His attack was so fucking strong, it warped space is what I'm understanding? Given a space nuke and an awesome cliffhanger. Mm. Today, I'll just be covering the fights leading up to that cliffhanger, but when it comes to Sid vs. Ragnarok or even Shadow Garden vs. Mordred, both have a lot more to it than what was shown in the anime. The former highlighted once again John Smith. Sid's tactical genius, while the latter showcased some new skills for Epsilon and Beta. And I hear in the manga or the light novel, Mordred was actually pretty strong. Mordred was actually putting up a good fight against Epsilon. But in the end, mate, the nights at the round table so far have been so disappointing, so fucking mid. But then people are saying, technically, Nelson is a researcher. He's a fucking bald old researcher. Give him some, you know, like, come on, like, he's not going to be strong. And Mordred kind of got done dirty in the manga or some other, you know, form of Eminence in Shadow. He was actually kind of strong. So if you want to see how it is those fights went to the novels or more behind Rose and the finale to her story, stick around since we'll cover all of that. Let's get started. Let's go. Episodes 31 and 32. Highest. Covering chapters 2 and 3 from... Highest is also the name of season 1 opening that started playing at the end. Fun fact. Volume 4 of the light novel. And this fucking volume 4 pretty much spoiled the fact that Nishino will show up again. But it's like, how? How the fuck is... It? This girl is actually coming back? Like, what's going on? She did. It's not often we get to see Zeta in action, but it's when we True. do that they're usually anime original. So, despite this scene not- Zeta gets so little screen time that even this was anime original? Bro, the animators were like, bro, are we even paying the Zeta voice actor anything? What the fuck are we doing? This girl is on a fucking contract. We're paying her money compared to the other Shadow Garden raids too. But she has said fucking nothing. Yo, put her in. What's going on? Not actually being in the novels, it's always nice to see Best Girl get a bit of screen time. The oh. actual beginning brings- and in uses favorite, you know, character is Zeta. I see, I see. Just to the day after Sid's personal spa day, and it's really find out this whole posh hotel is yet another market Mitsugoshi is planning to break into. This hotel business, breakfast, sauna, and then massage were all parts of a package Mitsugoshi was planning to create for their high-end beauty salon. Okay. Sid was of course given all this for free, but to him he felt it was just because that they were testing it on him. So with the basis of all these features clearly coming from the stories he'd told them about. What is this? What, what is this? Free is the best. Mitsugoshi Deluxe Hotel, a privately booked open air bath. Damn. Mitsugoshi's really just trying to get their hands into every market and dominate. Coming from the stories he'd told them about cosmetology and cosmetic surgery, mm -hmm. this made Sid once again cope hard with the lack of money he was making from it. <laughs> Now, the banter with Margaret and Epsilon went pretty much the same, so the next scene brings us to the mention of the Black Rose Brotherhood. I hear the 90% versus, you know, the slime content, it was like 99% versus like 0% for Margaret and Epsilon. I hear that was anime only. It was not like, um, it, it did not happen in the manga or the light novel. I'm not sure if that's true, though. It comes from the same vein as Sid's prison break and subsequent joining of the army, which, if you didn't know, are all scenes exclusive to the web novel. And I thought that maybe the movie would cover this prison arc, but no, no, it's not that at all. This is the original story the light novel is based off of, and it deals with both different events and different characters. Like, in the prison where Sid is just pretending to be a mob character, he reunites with Rose who's now what? known as this vigilante called the Owl. What? She's here to rescue her younger sister, Clara, and Clara's the one who's acting as the figurative spearhead for the Resistance. 
Is Clara alive in the anime right now? So clearly this turns into quite the different story from what we know, but it is cool to see it referenced here in the anime. Now, it's after Sid finds out the truth about the Queen that there was this cutscene involving both him and Epsilon. You see, after coming up with the plan to tell Rose about her mother, Sid would end up spotting Epsilon sneaking around looking for something. She was in the act of picking a lock, and it was this combined with the fact that she was concealing herself that made Sid- Clara doesn't exist in the light novel. Clara is not canon. So <laughs> we have we have an anime only sister. Okay. Curious as to what she was doing. So it was right as that lock popped itself open that Sid would confront her and ask what she was looking for. As it turns out, she was looking for the key that perfect the ring. Had. Obviously, she. Interestingly enough, I'm not sure if this is a minor detail or whatnot, but when Sid opened the new realm, right, some kind of like green thing opened up, right, with a portal. It was like green, like grids, like almost like the I'm Atomic purple grid that he sets up, but it's like green stuff showed up. And he like poked it, and then that ring broke as Sid opened the realm and just like disappeared. As does does that matter? Does that mean that the ring was used for something? Like I don't know. Does, does it just use too much power? I don't know. Out. She was looking for the key that Perv once Yeah, had. it's important. Obviously, she was talking about the ring, but to Sid who didn't know the ring was a key at all, he simply- Because, like, I forget, Mordred went on an entire dialogue about, like, how the Black Rose is formed. Like, you need a combination of the key, the royal blood, and all this other shit. But clearly, that is important to a mechanic when opening a dimension gap to, like, a different realm. He thought she was talking about a key to unlock the lock she was picking. It was a notion to which Sid responded by saying it wasn't necessary since to him the lock she needed the key for was, well, already open. This would then be perceived by Epsilon to be about the ring, so with her thinking the ring wasn't even important anymore, she could only praise Sid for being so amazing and progressing the plan so far. It was a lengthy series of compliments that Sid just perceived as Epsilon being dramatic again. To him, he had just wait, 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 wait. Let's go see all of Epsilon's glaze right now. <laughs> you never fail to amaze me, Master Shadow. How far out would you have to be have been to be able to prepare this? Truly, your eyes must hold a spark of divinity. <laughs> you are by far the noblest man of all creation. The glaze is fucking insane. Oh my goodness. To him, he had just made the most basic observation, but for Epsilon, she just made it seem like this was the biggest revelation in the world. It was the aspect of her character that Sid hoped would never change. Because she's good at role-playing. That's what's happening right now, guys. Sid acknowledges that Epsilon, she's the god of role-playing. She just pretty much just like on a GT RP stream, just fucking spamming plus one, plus one, plus one. Because she's so good at role-playing. That's what's going on. Now, aside from a more dramatic entrance for Sid's confrontation with Rose, there isn't much else to mention until we get to after the devastating reveal for her. So, with all her effort now seeming fruitless, Rose's only attachment left was the happy day she once had at Midgar Academy. <laughs> what she believed was for her kingdom, her father, her mother, and for her son. All those memories were fucking just like all misunderstandings with Sid though. <laughs> That's why I feel bad about Oriana. Because she's such a good girl, and she is truly in love with Sid, but Sid does not understand it that way at all. And all these misunderstandings are kind of helping her out, and technically, Sid and Shadow was there for Oriana all that time, but was it truly out of love? No. It's out of a fucking delusional Chuni fantasy, and this girl still thinks that the love of her life is their ride or die with her. And the ring, remember the ring fell out of his fucking pocket when he was on the piano and he disappeared? Like... Fuck. She probably feels like she got proposed to there. Self was now nothing more than lies which felt like the truth. The truth no longer felt real, and what wasn't real she couldn't even discern anymore. Oh, she didn't know what it was. that was fucking sweet cakes, right? That was Mama Oriana's sweet cakes getting clapped. Why did Shadow do this? <laughs> oh, no, I know why Shadow did this. It's because she deserved to know the truth, that she could turn into a tyrannical queen and, you know, fucking reclaim the kingdom. But, like, you just straight up showed a girl, uh, just like, in full, it just, we're just showing her mom get booty checks because it's clapped in front of her. Like, is this the first time Sid's traumatized Oriana? Someone made a comment. Someone made a very funny comment. I forget exactly what it was, but it was something along the lines of... This isn't the first time Shadow, like, traumatized another girl like this. Like, I think, an, I, not an identical scene, but a similar one that happened in the past. I just can't remember what that is right now. Anymore. She didn't know what it was she was trying to accomplish anymore. Well, Sherry Barnett? Was it Sherry Barnett? Did we traumatize another girl? <laughs> yeah, we traumatized Sherry Barnett. <laughs> now we're traumatizing Oriana. <laughs> 
<laughs> Iris, Iris is trauma. Yeah. I guess Sid really does just fucking, he's just a menace. He's going around just destroying the mental state of all these girls, dude. Oh my god. And even our Shadow Garden girls too, if you think about it, they're all just fucking brainwashed. They all drank the fucking Kool-Aid, dude. They're all fucking cult members. Cult of Diablos, my ass. This is the cult of Shadow. Bro is intentionally going out of his way. Like, he's not even trying to do it on purpose. It just happens, dude. Oh my god. Morant, the goal she'd been working towards didn't even seem real. Are we gonna traumatize Nishino next? Bro, Nishino is already like living, like we are living rent free in Nishino Akane's head because when we saw her in the season finale, you know what she said? It's been years. She's in her 20s. I don't know how long it's been. I don't know if time is running exactly proportional to the amount of time that we spent at, you know, um, whatever place fantasy isekai world we're in. But if Sid is 15, then let's say 15 years has passed and she's in her 20s. I, I don't know. Maybe let, let's just assume like 10 years has passed. This girl is still thinking about that one kid at school that didn't remember her fucking name every fucking day. <laughs> like, that's the only person she thinks about. Like, we've already gotten into our heads. Sid's really good at this, huh? The only thing she needs. And one last thing, that's right. We also mind broke Alpha. But Alpha, but then John Smith thought, like, huh, <laughs> great acting skills, Alpha. You're actually crying on the fucking train tracks. You now was that more than anything, she wanted everything to be over. It was right as that despair was about to take hold, though, that the Moonlight Sonata could be heard playing in the distance. So cool. And the pianist playing it was none other than Sid himself. This is an amazing callback to exactly what happened in season one, right? Oriana Rose is in her just, she's, she's just in despair. And what happens? She stumbles across a random shadow playing piano in an area where a piano shouldn't even exist. I believe this is some kind of underground sewage canal. And now he fucking brought the piano up to the balcony and started playing it. Like, it's so dumb, but it's such a cool entrance. At first, Rose believed this to be nothing more than just a dream. But after touching Sid's cheek and feeling his warmth, there was no... Excuse me? Play that, play that, say that, say that again. Any news? There was no doubt... Wait, 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 wait. Rose believed this to be nothing more than just a dream, but uh -huh. after touching Sid's cheek and... <laughs> after touching Sid's cheek and then... Feeling his warmth. <laughs> feeling the warmth of his gat! There was no doubt that the person before her was him. Mm. Sid would then give his epic speech, and the ring he would leave behind would be perceived as his way of proposing. That was so cool. The way... Okay, because, like, he was in his regular Sid voice just talking to Oriana, and then he, like, says the music cuts out. Then he talks in the shadow voice. I know, the other way around. He talks in the shadow accent, and then the music cuts out. Then suddenly, boom, he's gone. And then the ring is there. That shit was so cool. That was pretty cool. And the way that shadow also showed up was really cool, right? Because, like, Oriana had tea that Margaret was poured, right? Margaret poured the tea, and Oriana goes towards the window. And then, as soon as she turns around, shadow's already on the fucking couch, sipping on that tea. And those entrances are so sick. Posing to her. You see... Just like every misunderstanding before this, Rose was convinced that this was Sid's penultimate way of expressing his love to her. She knew he could never actually <laughs> Poor say girl, it dude. the pressure it would end up putting on her, but if there was any way to express it another way, a ring intended for their wedding was certainly just as powerful. To her, this was more than enough to show just how pure his love was for her. The ring was no doubt extremely expensive and the- No, but oh, she feels- I just feel bad for leading this girl on because Oriana's such a good character. But like, I, I thought we would ever get a moment where we actually breaks her heart. This show doesn't need to be that deep, right? She's never going to feel like, oh, I've been wronged all this time. It's not going to go that direction. But if you take a step back and try to like figure out, just understand what's going on, you start to feel really bad for these girls, dude. The intricate design of it clearly showed how much thought Sid put into choosing it. So with this being his last desperate attempt to convey his true irreplaceable love, Rose could see clearly what it was that needed to be done. She understood through Sid's dedication to his own goal that there was no excuse for her not to be putting that same effort towards her own. It's when we get to the next scene involving Perv that there were two important things worth mentioning about the this cult. This is a very funny scene. The first was the way the cult Baldi. perceived Shadow Garden, and the second was the reason Mordred was helping Perv at all. Since Perv had already seen Shadow's power firsthand, he knew the cult was definitely underestimating the enemies that were hunting them. Not only did they just recently start taking them seriously, but the extent of their knowledge didn't even cover Shadow Garden's most basic detail. I like this. In this panel, this is a, this is a nice one. It's a seven shades with their hood down, right? And you can't even see their eyes. But then, everybody just like kind of posing normally, and then you see Delta with their hands, like she's just going like this. 
I don't know. Something about that is so boss. I love this shit Shadow from Delta. Garden's most basic details yet. There was a severe lack of intel that Perf could only describe as negligence. The cult clearly still believed their power to be wholly unrivaled, but to Perf, this underestimation was definitely their biggest shortcoming. It was something he knew he would have to change from the inside. As for why Mordred was backing him, well, in exchange for granting him the 12th seat of the round, Perf would he have get? to use his new authority to back Mordred in the upcoming internal power struggle. That sounds really interesting. Internal power struggle within the Knights of the Round Table itself. The cult may have seemed like this firm draconian monolith before, but in actuality, there was all sorts of mini factions within it. What? And it's the presence of them and the power struggles between them that often present members like Perv a lot of opportunities for advancement. Okay, this is getting really interesting now. Internal factions having war against each other. And we've only really seen two members of the Knights of the Round Table so far. Only Nelson and Mordred. I think there's like, how many knights are there? Are there 12 knights? I'm not really sure. But this is getting really interesting. I want to get to know more about them. He just has to gain a little bit of power himself. Then after that, it's all about using said power to gain favor with whichever faction is currently controlling the cult. Huh. It's an interesting detail that shines light on something that was otherwise shrouded in darkness for us. It's also the core reason why Perv couldn't ask any of his guards to help look for the ring with him. So, with no choice but to proceed with the wedding without it, what that brings us to now is the setting for our climactic finale, a scene that begins with Rose's fearless rebellion. After having the night to think on what Sid and Shadow had told her, she was no longer plagued by the fears or regrets that were holding her back before. Her mind was as clear as the morning sky above her, and Rose would enter the church knowing exactly what it is she needed to do now. The ring would then reveal the king and the revelation of Perv's shadiness, but what captured Rose's attention was the way this recording appeared as if it was looking at her. The By video? all the rights, king? this video should have been exactly that, yet somehow the king's gaze was fixed on Rose regardless. Mm -hmm. It was as if his soul inhabited this late visage and was now looking back at the daughter he'd just entrusted everything to. I think this also plays into like how Rose felt so guilty about killing her dad. And all of that was cleared off with this video, right? This would lead Perv to go on the defensive, but despite threatening the hostage he supposedly had, Rose cared not for the mother who'd betrayed her too. Yeah, fuck the mom. To her, the only thing that mattered now was bringing the enemy of her nation to justice. So, it was after she reformed her dress into a rapier of white slime that the two would clash in a battle lasting- So the dress was a- okay. Dress into a rapier of white slime, and remember? Well, in, in, right now her hair is long. But there was a scene where she took her wig off, and people were saying the wig was actually slime. But then, people also then said, no, 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 the wig is a part of the dress which is all slime, so that the hair actually was slime. I don't know what's going on there, though. No more than three strikes. The first was all it took for Perv to see he was outmatched. The second, a series of after images leaving him disarmed. Then he the actually third fought went him. straight through his chest without so much as a moment's hesitation. Damn, we should have gotten that in the mo in the anime, but instead they did a cool off-screen with Mordred with this invisible blade immediately killing Perv and the mom. But if we actually saw- because I feel like Oriana didn't get her revenge. Like personally, you know? Like this is personal. You're driving the sword into Perv Asset, but I guess it's not going to happen in the anime. Before, Rose may have faulted on that final lunge, but no longer was she this weak girl who couldn't act on her own anymore. She was strong enough now to commit to whatever she thought was the best. Unfortunately, she never did get to commit that final blow, as before she could, Perv's head would already mm. be rolling. That's when Mordred comes in. No one could tell who it was that had done this, but there was one person present who seemed different from everyone. He was standing right there in the middle of the church, yeah. yet for some reason the mask. not a single person had noticed him yet. It wasn't until he spoke to make himself present that the people around him finally started paying attention to him. It was then that the guards would attempt to surround and subdue him, but they too would meet an end just as quick as Perv did. This would lead to Mordred's eventual opening of the fourth realm, and it's here the story Opening of the fourth realm, using the ring as the key, and... And... I'm not really sure. You have the royal blood, the key, like, you know, the stuff about how the realms were opening and how fucking Sid was able to open a realm to Earth, but the key broke. ...to become a little bit different. You see, it wasn't Ragnarok that appeared right at the beginning, but instead the hordes of smaller monsters just as terrifying. They would charge at anyone and everyone present, including Margaret, who was actually currently <laughs> being attacked by one. Ed, could you imagine if Kevin showed up and saved 
Maggie Waggy, my Maggie Poo, my love of my life. Bro, I'm just telling you, if there was a moment like that where Kevin showed up out of fucking nowhere and saved Margaret, it doesn't even need to, like, like it's not that much effort, right? But if he get murked, maybe. I, I don't know. They, they, they could make it funny. You know, they could have a funny scene where he tries to save her and she feels like she looks even more disgusted and she, like, runs away and, like, abandons Kevin. I don't know. Do something like that, right? I would have fucking dropped down laughing, dude. Luckily, Rose was able to jump yeah, in Rose. and save her, Should've but been Kevin. one made zero dent in the multiple that were spawning to replace it. It did, however, serve as the moment Rose and Margaret could rekindle their relationship. Yeah, they're good now. That only mattered if they could survive, though, since what lay in front of them was a never-ending horde of man-eating monsters. It was an endless wave that was multiplying faster than it was diminishing. Fortunately, she wasn't without help, though, since it was only a moment later that six- How did this work? Because, like, this? Because, like, remember? Remember that to Sid, this is all role play. This is all random role play. And none of these girls, Shadow Garden doesn't exist, but like he knew that everybody in the wedding attendance, as soon as he fucking went like this, right? Everybody said the line together. So that must, well, Lambda was technically there. So maybe Shadow used Lambda as a cue. It's like, oh, it's Lambda's here. Maybe she, you know, organized, she fucking made a post on Craigslist and got like 20 girls to fucking sign up for this random fucking role playing arc and said the lines, you know? We are Shadow Garden, those who lurk in the shadows in order to hunt the shadows. But it's like, as soon as he did this, everybody got up and it's like, holy shit. Without help though, since it was only a moment later that 664 and 665 Let's go. 559 would show up shortly after. But she would not help. She would only glare at Moriana. But then so too would Beta and Epsilon. They had all come to assist. Oh my god, Beta. Beta, I might have... I might have been underestimating your game, Beta. Oh my goodness. ...in this final battle against the Night Beyond Men. Mordred had expected that they would, so it was the moment they did that he would summon Ragnarok, a massive demon that would waste zero time charging straight towards Beta and Epsilon. Damn, they went for El- was about to obliterate what? them, though, that Shadow would jump in and slice its wing off. Okay. That was a bit different, right? So in the anime, Ragnarok was summoned- just to kind of, in general, to scare everybody. And then Shadow comes up out of nowhere, right? And the coolest thing is in the anime, Shadow was still playing the organs in the church as like the fucking boss theme. He was straight up, he was, he was straight up the one playing the boss music for Ragnarok when he was getting summoned. But then, as soon as Ragnarok gets summoned, right? Shadow then instantly shows up in one shot so that you could actually say, no, Shadow was not playing his, the boss theme for Ragnarok. He was actually playing the boss theme for himself and then he showed up, which was actually in my head canon, way cooler. He had engaged with an attack so incredibly powerful that the aftershocks of its impact reverberated all throughout the capital. It was a feat that was definitely quite the impressive one, but Mordred knew it would take a lot more than that to defeat the Grand Ruler of the Fourth Realm. So, it was as Mordred was expressing his confidence that Shadow would cut him off and pursue the real- Whoa, 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 is this the manga? Whoa, look at this. Whoa, look at- look at Shadow looking all murderous here, right? Look at this. As Mordred was expressing his confidence that Shadow- A lot of bark for a muck. <laughs> a muck? Okay, <laughs> sure. A mook. Would cut him off and pursue the real threat. Yeah, he is dual wielding he had no too. In Look. Conversing with someone as insignificant. Only time he dual wields in the anime is with the crowbars, but right now he seems to be dual wielding something. And as Mordred was, since the beast had fallen away outside the capital, though, just like how Sid had done in episode nine, he enveloped his legs with gross amounts of magic, then leaped at mock speed so he could follow it there, leaving Epsilon and Beta alone with Mordred now. For the roast session of his fucking life. Your hat, trash. Your cape, trash. Your sword, trash. For the most part, a lot of this was pretty much the same, but... Your haircut too, it's a fucking artifact. A wig. You're bald. Trash. The beginning was actually a lot more technical. You see, because neither wanted to make a move first, both parties were cautiously half-stepping around in circles with each other. Altogether, they would come to a halt, then out of nowhere, Mordred would engage with his artifact The blade. soundtrack Beta was and News is playing right now? But this soundtrack he's playing right in the background is incredibly hype. Epsilon, who was just a bit slower than her, got her cheek cut just barely by the edge of it. It was a shock to Rose since not many are known to be strong enough to even fight the Seven Shadows, yet alone injure them. That, however, was just a gimmick, so it was once that gimmick was known that the rest of the fight became child's play for them. 
especially since Mordred wasn't the only one with an invisible weapon at their disposal. This wasn't shown in the anime, but hmm? it was here that Epsilon would unveil one of the most extraordinary Why? abilities out of anyone. Why? It was a move not even thought to be possible, yet here Mordred was getting- Increasing your titty size? Why? Whoa, whoa, his hair chopped off because of it. He didn't even see it coming, then all of us- She also has an invisible weapon? Sudden tufts of his hair were falling out as something invisible- He's bald?! ...flew right past him. At first, it it's took a wig? few seconds to figure out what it was, but when he realized the only thing it could be was magic, Mordred had come to see that Epsilon was quite literally throwing magic at him. Oh. That may not sound like that, that big of a deal, what? but in a world where magic isn't controllable when detached from a person's body, to bypass such a limitation was... <laughs> Oh, like, literally throwing, like, waves of magic and shit like that is fucking insane, right? Be most people just, like, reinforce the magic into a weapon or some other shit, but, like, she's just throwing fucking magic beams, magic beams, and fucking, Extremely yeah. Extremely powerful. Okay. It's an elite skill that requires not only an incredible amount of mana, but also a lifetime of control. training in how to control it. So, again, her practice, her lifetime's worth of practice, you know, molding the size of her titties and ass comes into play here. It's all important, guys. Since magic has only ever dispersed when losing its physical tether, to see it being controlled without one was beyond belief for Mordred. In fact, the very prospect of doing it was thought to be impossible. If it wasn't, then every Dark Knight Anne everywhere Rose. would have given up their pursuit of the sword and instead focused on throwing their magic instead. That That's kind of true, huh? I never... I. This is really interesting that Annie News is going down to explain how magic the, ma the mechanics of magic because it's like if you could just fucking just use like spirit beams and just like laser beams and stuff like that right like why would you ever pick up the sword and just like do all this shit right just fucking boom uh, just beam attacks right that that would be so much easier that's just how oppressive this form of combat was obviously mordred wasn't just gonna give up because of that but he was definitely more worried since the disadvantage was tremendous now if we switch over to Shadow's fight with Ragnarok now, I want to make it clear that he genuinely thought he was fighting a bat here. Yeah, he made a comment, huh? So this is what a bat looks like in Isekai, huh? Like, he, I don't understand the level of delusion you need <laughs> to think that this is a fucking bat you're fighting in this current situation. But wait, you think they fucking hired this bat as an actor too for your fucking fight? I, I don't get it. You really have to wonder what the fuck is going on in his head when everything is happening. I think a lot of people, again, when they don't under, when they don't really think about the core concept of the foundation of Eminence and Shadow and how Shadow thinks that this is all fake, Shadow Garden is fake, we're, we're all just playing around, we're all just role playing. But then you still have moments like this when a fucking portal from a dimensional warp opens up and this Ragnarok is summoned and you think it's a bat. Like, what are the mental gymnastics that you're doing in your head? For you to be able to think that this is not a big deal. It's crazy. Grant. It's, it's really crazy. And I, I really truly think that most people that watch this show get caught up in the hype moments and don't really realize the state of Sid's mind and what he's thinking when all this shit is going on. Because again, all the cool stuff kind of overrides the, the idea or the foundation of this show, which is that she's just a fucking schizo fucking chuny did he knew it was an oversized demonic bat but the thought of it being a demon lord definitely didn't occur to him the story he'd come up with instead was that this was the anti-rose faction doing their best to prevent rose from coming into power okay. a last ditch attempt at continuing this ongoing power struggle yeah I, and you know what that makes a lot more sense yeah that's a that's a good explanation so i guess the anti-perv faction hired this fucking bat too okay sure Sid made sure to acknowledge the whole Demon Lord vibe Ragnarok was giving off, but... You know, you look kinda badass. You've got that whole Demon King vibe down pat. Once again, all this was just a facade for him. So, as the Eminence and Shadow and an ally to the Tyrant, Sid knew his job was to eliminate Ragnarok as stylishly as possible. Preferably a single attack followed by an ominous exit. Mm. Such an attack wasn't gonna happen immediately though, since the opponent Sid was facing was Disaster Incarnate. Each strike eviscerated the land below it, and every attack left a fiery crater wherever it made impact with. If Sid was to compare this power to his own, it definitely wasn't outside the realm of possibility, but oh? to pull it off at a scale like that would require a charge up. Another difference between him and the beast was the predictable nature in which it attacked with. You see, so long as he dodged its attacks long enough, Sid knew he'd eventually come to see any and all attacks this monster was capable of. So there's no technique going on here. The monster Ragnarok is just brute force. And he's just like a very simple boss with basic boss patterns. And 
to Sid, this is probably a huge disappointment because he's all about like a conversation in combat, right? When you're doing like a 1v1 duel, it's like literally a conversation. So if you're unable to adapt to Sid, you know, countering all your moves and you're, you're repeating the same moves over and over again, you're literally just like a fucking an AI NPC bot you're fighting, you know? You already understand the premeditated move that's going to happen. This provides a completely different message from the anime because hitting hard from the get-go wasn't what Sid was planning at all. In fact, he had even said himself that slashing at Ragnarok would only wear him out too much. I think he said something like also in like this aerial combat, this is ridiculous. So that's when John Smith's string worked. But then you gotta think about it. How the fuck are you using John Smith's string in mid-air when the string needs to have like an end point to stick to for it to work, you know? Whenever I see these string powers in outside areas, people's argument that of how the string works is that, well, it's not really attached. The end is not attached to anything. He's just pretty much just like using the strings as like a claw almost. But in the finale, it really looked like he made a net outside in the fucking sky. Where are the strings attaching to? Does it matter? No, it does not. So what Sid had chosen to do instead was literally camp it out like a boss fight in Dark Souls. Smart. He had chosen to take advantage of this beast's simple nature and wait it out until the extent of its movesets were known to him. Obviously, he knew there would be certain exceptions, but attacks like that were more so random than the product of careful consideration. They were these one-time moves he was much more comfortable looking out for once the rest were known to him. One such attack had actually hit him pretty hard, but by shifting his body and channeling everything into defense, Sid was able to absorb the impact and disperse it in a way that was the least harmful to him. It was a defensive maneuver he could pull oh. off in his sleep if he wanted to. That we would have never known that from the anime though, huh? So he can like pretty much break his fall, break all the, the, the impact or the damage, the force that's applied upon him, he can just kind of break all that off too. His nice. organs and bones seemed fine just after, but the same unfortunately couldn't be said for his bangs. Oh yeah! They were he specifically mentioned, no, no, no. It was not against the, was it the battle against Ragnarok? No, I'm pretty sure it was Awakened Mordred that he said, oh, my bangs got singed. I'm pretty sure it was Mordred. I'm not, maybe? Singed for but an instant before Sid had cut them off before anyone else could see. <laughs> he would then respond in a way befitting the eminence and shadow, not because. It was against Ragnarok, okay. Oh man, we didn't get a moment like this. He was never angry that his, his bangs got singed though. He straight up got so angry. How dare you inflict such an injury upon me? Not my bangs. He was talking to the beast in front of him, but instead because there might be someone else listening. It was the mandatory next step for someone so dedicated to their craft. In any case, with that giving Sid enough time to finish up his preparations, he would then unveil the threads of magic that he'd been- Like, like, okay, 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 he, right here. It's the open sky! Where are the strings connecting? Huh? You need a start and an end point. Like, if it was in a fucking closed room, then yes, the different walls is where the strings are fucking connecting to. But you, I, I, the finger, yeah, okay. Think about this, Psyche. The finger is where the strings start from, but where does it end? Where's the end point? Let's say he starts from the finger. But where is the end? Where is it attaching to? What do you mean? It, it starts from the finger, I get it. But where is it going? It needs to stick to something. The, the other finger is holding for the... The other finger is the holding the start of the other strings. There's, there's two starting points right now. Think about this. L look at the screen right now. You're telling me that Sid somehow had the wingspan of that of Ragnarok the Moor and he's basically just going like this. That doesn't make any sense. Look. If you're saying that his fingers are the start and the end points, that means that his wingspan right now is greater than the size of Ragnarok, which is not true. This is false. Y'all are y'all are capping. No, y'all are fucking capping. No, I'm just I I don't think this needs to be dissected. This doesn't need to be looked into this deeply. But whenever I see string powers being used, right, even in fucking Attack on Titan, whenever they're using the ODM gear. And it's like in broad fucking daylight without trees. At least Attack on Titan has the fucking, you know, they, 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 ha they, they, they are not so shameless. So that they all disclose that, oh, in an open field without trees, it's hard to use our ODM gear or EDM gear. So we need to ride on horses. But not here. They're like, fuck it. <laughs> Don't care. String just works. Entire time. This wasn't the move that would kill it, but it was the first step. He looks sick here, though. And the John Smith string coming back at the end was a very nice touch. In the process towards winning. 
You see, despite these wires not being strong enough to deal anything serious, the fact they dealt damage at all was enough to make Ragnarok wary of them. This meant he was no longer willing to ignore Sid's magic in the slightest, but what that actually- This is a name technique? Nocturnal birdcage? Yo, he should have said that. What actually meant was that it would be reacting the way that Sid wanted it to from now on. What I mean is that all Sid needed to do to get Ragnarok to move the way he wanted it to was apply mana to some wires and get him to dodge a certain way. It was the product of this beast not understanding what it was that had hit him, but just at dumb. the same time instinctually knowing it wanted to avoid it. Since the root of it came from Sid's magic, whenever it would sense it, even if it was just a little bit, it would go and dodge exactly the way that Sid intended it to. It's too so predictable, man. the manipulation man. of it was now nothing more than child's play, and the fight for Sid was all but over now. It was a simple task since the method to beating it would have been the same for any beast. You could have fucking said that, like, this Ragnarok compared to Sid, like, this battle, yeah, you can acknowledge that Ragnarok's brute strength is that strong. Probably one of the strongest we've seen so far, but, like, this is such an easy battle for him. Like, if you, like, dumber than Delta, straight up. He, he did say that, right? Delta got straight bullets in the finale. I'm pretty sure he got compared to Delta. It's like, damn, really? That's cold. That's the reason he decided to declare it dumber than yeah! Delta. Yeah, oh my god, I come on! For Mordred in That's anime, fucked up! It was in the novels that he had actually used it here. Okay. Now, if we the go anime the it was for Mordred. The anime was for Mordred, but in the manga it was for Ragnarok, I think. Blonde. Their victory was evident from the moment the battle had started. Something Rose had noticed about Beta, though, was that she had very little interest in the fight itself. She didn't seem to find combat all that interesting, and okay. there was little personality that came out through her fighting style. That's not to say she wasn't skilled, though, because out of- A uh, very skilled apartment here, but, like, we never got to see the bows. We never get to see the Master of Garden weapons that we see here, right? This is Master of Garden mobile gaming wallpaper. But she uses a bow and Epsilon uses a sight, but we never get to see them. Of all the people who were trained by Shadow, Beta has replicated his style with the highest accuracy. So, sure she may not care for fighting and all its intricacies, but what that really means is she's perfected exactly what it is Shadow has taught her. She's taken the teachings he so graciously bestowed her with and applied them to herself in the purest way possible. Okay. This next part is actually some of the most important and yes. gotten ever, so- The center. God, the center of the fucking universe? I don't know. The Cult of Diablos Marks? You have all these different realms revolving around this origin center part. What's there? Who is over there? Rather than include it as a short part in this video, I'm actually gonna make a separate video instead- Atlantis on- Ooh! Just when I said in the beginning of this video that this might be one of the last Eminence and Shadow videos we'll get to farm from any use, my man's about to drop a fucking video explaining how maybe the realms and mechanics work, right? This is gonna be good. An explanation yes. to Mordred's position as well as the significance of Rose and the Oriana Kingdom. Nice! There are two bits of lore that are actually quite interesting, and one might even give a valid reason for Sid's reincarnation. So now, le okay, let me try to cook for a little bit here. Probably not much I can do here, but so in the beginning of season one, this is like a funny scene where Sid just ran out into the fucking uh, the truck, right? Because he's like, he was like going crazy in the mountains. In the beginning, I thought that this is just a meme anime. So he was bashing his head against the rock because he knew a truck was coming to hype himself up to jump in front of the truck because breaking the fourth ball, you know, like meta gaming. Like, yeah, he's like, happens when you get hit by a truck. But then, no, it was explained that he was actually training in the mountains. He was in like a delusional state because he was training for it. And while doing that, he saw a, a faint source of light, which is the truck coming by. And he thought that if I go towards that light, it'll be like, I don't know, make me closer to magic. And now let's think about the mechanics that we've learned in season finale and how this could actually make sense in basically being reincarnated. Well, being reincarnated and being transported into a different realm are two different things. You need the key and you need like royal blood. Oriana's blood mixed with the key, I think, is the, is the key to opening a different realm, right? Or at least that's how Black Rose was used to summon the fourth realm ruler. And at the end of finale, Sid's power was so strong with the I'm Atomic, like galactic level, he opened a gap. And, but that, but the, and then the ring collapsed, so maybe the key was still there. But like here, he's actually dying to get resurrected. But he still did transport it to a different realm. It's just that his soul, 
right? His body was left here, but his like, his, like soul was somehow like transplanted into the different realm. Instead of shadow en entering a realm, it's like his soul transferred realms. How does this all work though at this current state where Sid is just a regular base human and it's only Truck-kun, right? There is something missing here. Something is missing here. Unless Truck-kun is the key. And this is actually the truck of Diablos, guys. You heard it here first. This, my friend, is the truck of Diablos. And somehow it's the key, the opening a realm into fucking wherever we are now. I don't know. I, that's the only, that, I can only cook that much. I don't know what's going on here, but that's it for me. So that's a video that should be out tomorrow. All right. Where we'll continue from for here, though, is right after Mordred is struck by the falling demon arm. At first, he couldn't believe that one person was capable of doing this, but what pushed him over the edge was the idea that Shadow had planned to. The very notion was inconceivable, but when considering Shadow Garden's presence, Rose's ring, and the allowance of Ragnarok's summoning, the only answer to all of it was because Shadow had wanted it this way. He had come to see that Shadow wanted to observe them and was letting them roam free so that he could come and destroy the Black Rose after. Once again, Mordred couldn't even fathom how someone could achieve this, but as pieces of Ragnarok rained across the capital, it was clear the only person who could was Shadow. Mordred would then resort to becoming a beast himself, which to Sid was- So in the manga, I guess he just took a bite out of it, but in the anime, he just went complete schizo and he put his head into the, the flesh of, you know, Ragnarok, right? It's a boring follow-up since at least the bat was powerful. He was actually disappointed since Mordred had- Yeah, he called him like a- like a dud. I forget the exact words that he said. He called him like a failed transformation. What did he say again? Degraded himself to a level not even worth respecting anymore. Damn. Sid was dodging without Mordred even noticing, then whenever he would look around to find where Sid had gone, Sid would just be staring at the sky spouting his usual eminence and shadow shtick. Yeah, he was he showing Mordred he wasn't even worth paying attention to. The only thing you absorb from his beast is its stupidity. You are beyond salvation. He, he, he would have been funny if he fucking threw another fucking side straight bullet. <laughs> that Delta right here. You're done with that Delta. Now, I can neither confirm nor deny that Sid's attack lit up the entire solar system. Yeah. The idea what happened there? Is just so amazing. We then have everyone watching in awe as it happens, and out of all the people who were shown to. This girl again with the cult of Diablo symbol. Is Annie News about to tell us something good here? What's going on here with this religious looking girl? To be doing so, I believe this is the only one worth noting. I'm not 100% sure who it is, but based on the hair, I would have to say it's Zeta. Huh? And let's think about this. I think Zeta holding the Cult of Diablo symbol like this right here in front of her hides her middle cleavage to her diamond's inner middle cleavage, right? So even more, more detail of the authors, uh, no, the, the animators showing us that, hey, this seems like a new girl, but it's actually Zeta. And we're just going to hide a little bit, right? You can't really see her face. You can see her hair. Her middle cleavage, her signature middle cleavage is, you know, hidden. And yeah, so is that a grave? What is going on there, right? What are those rocks I see? I don't really know, but I, we're getting near spoiler territory. So careful, guys. This is the only one worth noting. I'm not 100% sure who it is, but based on the hair, I would have to say it's Zeta. Hmm. But yeah. That brings us to the end of the Shadow vs. Ragnarok fight. It's not quite the full extent of the finale, but it is everything that I wanted to mention in this video. The stuff with Earth and Shadow are all things yeah. I'm going to be covering in the next video. Ooh, we're going to watch that. Yep, that's right. So, if you liked this and want to see that, then be- You know what to do. Like his videos, guys. Please, go to Annie's channel. Like his videos. Subscribe to his channels. He always gives such good informational, you know, inf information about the stuff that's in the anime. That was cut out, right, from the light novel. So, dub video from Annie News. But we got another Annie News video about the mechanics of different realms and possibility what the next arc is going to be, right? So, hey, we'll be there for that, okay?